Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Emily and Philip for um, <coughs> organizing this fascinating, fascinating session for accepting my paper. Um, I'm a bit old school today. Um, there's no PowerPoint. I've been dealing with this infernal PowerPoint for all this academic year, and I'm I'd kind of like a break today. So um, now that uh, teaching for um, for the semester is done, um, today it's uh, it's just me, um, primarily uh, reading a paper. So um, I'd also like to thank our previous speakers for your stimulating talks, um, from which I've actually been inspired and have learned quite a lot. Um, and I must apologize in advance for not being able to stay within this session um, for the remainder of the day, as um, I know several other people have done um, for this conference. And as we do from time to time, I foolishly submitted proposals for two papers, um, and I'll be giving a paper in another session later this afternoon. Um, so I already do regret not being able to be here in this session now for the rest of today's discussion, but I do look forward to catching um, some of those papers, hopefully through the recordings. Uh, now, as my title and abstract indicate, I'm here to talk about place theory, process philosophy, and how these might be able to be brought together in archaeological explorations of place. Now, I must begin by saying that um, I am an archaeologist with a particular, um, particularly transdisciplinary approach that's heavily influenced by sociocultural anthropology and humanistic geography. And that although technically I am a doctor of philosophy, um, I'm actually a, a, a true neophyte when it comes to philosophy as a, as a formal subject area. So those true philosophers in the room, please be kind to me. Um, now I've organized my paper into three key sections. First, there'll be an overview of place theory as it's developed within humanistic geography and the philosophy of place. We'll then move on to a further, very brief overview of process philosophy and then a final, just short discussion of how I think these may be able to come together in approaches to archaeology. So I've particularly wrestled with concepts of place for several years. This was initially inspired by my first archaeological experiences conducting fieldwork and research at a multi-millennial tell site in the Near East, especially at Tal Hispan in central Jordan. Now while I began as an undergraduate investigating the dynamics of cultural change, so-called Hellenization and Romanization um, for the site's classical periods. This was within a much wider um, framework led by the site's directors that sought to narrate Hispan over the long durée, emphasizing its accumulated contemporary significance even more than any individual periodic episode. Now this was earth shattering to me as I had previously thought of archeological sites as neatly belonging to particular periods. For example, Neolithic Stonehenge, Roman Hadrian's Wall, and British Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, USA. Now with this project, I was challenged by the fact that archeological sites can dramatically change in terms of use and significance, even beyond their most prominent periods. And even though um, this metaphor is probably overused, um, and I originally wrote here, now less in vogue, but I'm pleased to see that the uh, two previous speakers have actually used it uh, as well. The presentation of an ancient tell site as a kind of material palimpsest was eye-opening, um, and it forever changed my perspective. So as I began my postgraduate studies, and at least temporarily shifted my research focus to Northern Britain, I adopted a diachronic approach to exploring Roman period <coughs> monuments, tracing their historiographies and later uses and significances from the Roman period up toward the present day. First with the now destroyed Roman temple, victory monument or mausoleum, we're not sure, um, called Arthur's Oon or Arthur's Oven near Falkirk, and then with the 40 mile long um, Antonine Wall that stretches across Scotland's central belt. Now as I was initially setting out um, to complete an historiographic study that began with antiquarian rediscoveries of these monuments, my PhD supervisor suggested that I consider modeling my methodology on the early modern practice of choreography. And as I developed this line of research, I became increasingly aware of both affinities and tensions between this Renaissance revival of a classical tradition 
and more recent theoretical work on place that had been developing within humanistic geography and philosophy since the 1970s. Now all of this I published two papers specifically on choreography, one that promotes humanistic geography place thinking to Roman archaeologists, and I completed my PhD thesis that draws upon place theory to fundamentally reframe the Antonine Wall not as a monument of the Roman military, circa AD 140 to 160, but as a place that exists in the present and for which contemporary meaning and significance derives from an accumulation of memories, meanings, and experiences from its initial construction onward. And I firmly believe that archaeologists should seek to unravel this full lifespan rather than merely focus on the period of the wall's initial construction and original <coughs> functional use. Now, place continues to occupy an important position with my own thinking and research, and I'm pleased to bring you all into my ongoing cogitations today. So as I've written about place theory in some depth, I'm only going to briefly summarize here today, but current perspectives on place have been, I believe, most rigorously developed in the fields of human geography and philosophy. Among some of the foundational works are those of the geographers Yi Fu Tuan, Edward Ralph, and the philosophers Edward Casey and Jeff Malpas. Other writers have elaborated on the ideas of these theories and they've, of these theorists, and they've created a rich body of place-centered works across multiple disciplines. Now, there's not always general agreement, and there are indeed important differences abounding within the works of these various scholars, but there are several key ideas that I think dominate. And it's the human geographer, Tim Cresswell, who I believe has provided the best single volume introduction to this broad discourse, which I call contemporary place theory. And fundamentally, place theory defines the concept of place as something more than a physical location or a dot on a map, but as a location that has been made meaningful. Location itself may remain important, but Cresswell notes that places are not always fixed. In fact, he illustrates this through the example of a ship, which he says may become a special kind of place for people who share it on a long voyage, even though the actual location is shifting. Um, and in place theory then, meaning is not an inherent aspect of these physical locations, but it comes from the subjective and emotional attachment that people have to place. And places thus have a relationship to humans and the human capacity to produce and to consume meaning. Now for Tuan, the key term is experience. And it is the meaning that derives from our experiences in um, particular locations that transforms them from mere space into place. He also points out that meaning need not necessarily come from direct experience, but may also be vicariously gained through the reception of written or spoken communication, whereby knowledge, ideas, and understandings of a place, even imaginary ones, are gained. And he illustrates this by quoting the physicist Werner Heisenberg, who recounts a visit that he shared to Denmark's Kronberg Castle with Niels Bohr, and I'll quote this. Isn't it strange how this castle changes as soon as one imagines that Hamlet lived here? As scientists, we believe that a castle consists only of stones, and we admire the way the architect put, put them together. The stones, the green roof with its patina, the wood carvings in the church, these constitute the whole castle. None of this should be changed by the fact that Hamlet lived here, and yet it has changed completely. No one can prove that he really lived, let alone that he lived here. But everyone knows the question Shakespeare had him ask, the human depth he was made to reveal, and so he too had to be found a place on earth, here in Kronberg. And once we know that, Kronberg becomes quite a different castle for us. So there is thus a clearly phenomenological aspect to place, and it is this, particularly the embodied experience, that has probably been the most visibly drawn upon aspect um, developed within archaeology. Now I'd like to point out just two other important aspects of place theory. The matter of scale 
and a debate over whether or not places are static or dynamic. Now, according to Tuan, places exist at different scales, from an armchair or a corner in a room to the entire earth. And this matter of scale adds greater tension to the relationship between place and space, and it raises important problems for purely spatial analysis approaches. And this is further complicated by the fact that individual places may in fact be nested. For example, a chair is located in a particular room, in a particular flat, on the third floor of a building, in a certain area of the city, etc. And the relationship between such nested places as individual locations of particular meanings and significance may be one of independence, but it's far more likely to involve inheritance, whereby two or more are defined, at least in part, by the characteristics and meanings of the others. Now, such an inheritance may work in either direction. A chair may hold particular meaning and significance because of its location within a certain room. Or the room may derive its essential character from the existence of the chair, your grandfather's chair, for example, your long lost grandfather's chair. Of course, it could also be argued that the relationship is bi-directional with both the chair and the room depending upon one another for meaning and definition. There's also been a debate within place discourse over whether they are static or dynamic in nature. Now, given what we've already covered, this may appear somewhat odd, but I'll try to explain. In Tuan's de differentiation between space and place, space is described as areas through which we move while place comes into being when we pause. In his chapter on time and place, Tuan says that place is an organized world of meaning. And if we see the world as a process constantly changing, we should not be able to develop any sense of place. Now this view has been challenged by the geographer Alan Pred, who criticized this humanistic geography conception of place as an inert, experienced scene. And he offered his own formulation of place as what takes place or occurs ceaselessly, what contributes to history in a specific context through the creation and utilization of a physical setting. And building on the ideas of Giddens structuration theory, Pred's argument is that while the structures of place give meaning to our actions, human agents are responsible for the creation of such structures. And through this agency of action, the structures of place can be overturned, transformed, and supplanted by new structures through repetitive practices that may change over time. From this perspective, place cannot be viewed as static, but rather as a continual process. And in this respect, a place is never completed, but is constantly in the process of becoming. And as we'll see, this is pointing us in the direction of process philosophy. For my part, in an uh, article I've published in the Theoretical Roman Archaeology Conference Proceedings in 2015, um, I attempted to reconcile these contradictory perspectives by arguing that place can be simultaneously viewed as static and dynamic, both pause and action. If we return to Tuan's original idea of place as a meaningful location constructed by experience. This formula suggests that the meanings we ascribe to a place are based on the totality of our experience in and of that location. From this perspective, the place as a particular combination of locations and meanings derived from this totality is constructed and exists only in the present. For <coughs> moment by moment and experience by experience, place gives way to new place. And building on phenomenology, place is always perceived and experienced in the present. Thus, place as the commingling of location and experience in the present is static, and it provides a type of snapshot image that encapsulates the particularities of that present experience, building on previous iterations. So I was therefore delighted to see this session's title riffing on the notion of um, place iterations. 
Now, while archaeologists have engaged with some aspects of this rich discourse, probably most notably through um, Richard Bradley and Chris Tilley, explicit and deep engagement that not only feeds from, but also feeds back into this interdisciplinary discourse, I think is severely lacking. It's something I'd like to, to see us address. But now we'll briefly turn to process philosophy, which is most commonly associated with the work of Alfred North Whitehead, but has a much deeper pedigree that stretches back to the pre-Socratic philosophers, such as Heraclitus of Ephesus. In a survey of key issues within process philosophy, Rescher begins by summarizing the philosophy's distinctive opposition to an Aristotelian view that emphasizes things and gives primacy to substance and its ramifications. Now this perspective has gone on to underpin much of Western philosophy, building upon Aristotle and his insistence on the metaphysical centrality of ostensibly indicatable objects. Process philosophy, on the other hand, offers an alternative ontology that emphasizes verbs rather than nouns. We can seek to understand reality by recognizing and classifying the physical substance of objects and things, but events, occurrences, and processes are just as real and indeed underlie the physical being with a capital B of things, which from this perspective should not be so much recognized as being, but as becoming. Now Heraclitus is famous for observing that no person can step into the same river twice, but his student Cratillus took this even further, arguing that it was impossible even to step into the same river once. This highlights a key principle within process philosophy all things are constantly in the process of change. And in this pre-Socratic illustration, the river changes even as we step into it. And so do we. Rescher summarizes, a process philosopher is someone for whom temporality, activity, and change of alteration, striving, passage, and novelty emergence are the cardinal factors for our understanding of the real. Ultimately, it is a question of priority. And for the process philosopher, process has priority over product, both ontologically and epistemically. Now the dominant philosoph Western philosophical view may seek to downgrade process by arguing that all there is in the world are things and their properties and actions. But this is too simplistic and it fails to recognize a whole range of processes that do not represent the actions of things. What thing, for example, is evaporation? Freezing, a fall in barometric pressure, birth, love, kindness, or death. Things are absolutely implicated in these processes, but these processes are not in themselves things but a deep entanglement of countless micro and macroscopic processes in interaction. A process ontology thus greatly simplifies matters. Instead of a two-tier reality that combines things with their inevitable coordinated processes, it settles for a one-tier ontology of process alone. It, it sees things not just as the products of processes, since one cannot avoid doing so, but also as the manifestations of processes, as complex bundles of coordinated processes. It replaced the replaces the troublesome ontological dualism of things and activity with an internally complex monism of activities of varying potentially compounded sorts. And if simplicity is an advantage, process ontology has a lot to offer. So now as I begin to conclude, how might process philosophy, place theory, and archaeology come together. Um, I'm going to welcome addition to literature and archaeological theory. Gosden and Malaforis boldly argue for process thinking within archaeology. So I'm, I'm not alone in doing so. Um, and they emphasize the exploration of modes of becoming rather than being. Um, they call this process archaeology or P-arc in order to um, avoid the confusion of what most people dealing with process philosophy and other disciplines would call processual 
because that, that, that term would be problematic in, in terms of archaeology. Um, so this partially work, builds on work by Ingold and Latour, and it grants priority to process over substance, recognizes that there's no such thing as inert, timeless, or formless matter, and it argues that flow and form, continual transformations between energy and matter, are the basic ontological ingredients of human becoming. Now, what I would like to argue for is an archaeological approach to, that shifts the focus away from the material remains or things of the past in themselves and more squarely emphasizes the processes that these material remains are the products and manifestations of. In my case, I've primarily been interested in the larger scale aspects of archaeology in the form of sites and their wider landscapes and have been attempting to develop an archaeology of place that focuses on meanings that are accumulated and transformed around given locations or regions via human experience, memories, and interactions with the natural environment and other humans. I'm convinced that the transdisciplinary discourse on place theory has much to offer here. And I'm encouraged by the affinities offered by positioning place within a broader process philosophy. And to conclude, I'd just like to ask us all to consider what is it that we are focusing on when we talk about or investigate archaeological sites and monuments? Are they merely constellations of various physical material elements? Do they have an inherent, universal, and timeless significance and meaning? Do they belong to particular chronological periods, cultures, or people? Can we separate out the possible Neolithic, Roman, and or medieval characters and significances from each other and from the present day? Or can and should we view archaeological sites from a more complex place and process framework that recognizes their continuous becoming, transformation, and iteration in which our own engagement, experiences, and actions are just as much a part of their becoming as those of people of the past. And further, when talking about the sites and monuments that we focus upon within our archaeological research, can we really step into the same site twice or even once? And if not, what are the implications of this for our site interpretations? Perhaps more importantly, the ways in which we present these sites to the public. Thank you.